Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Suraj, and today we're going to be walking through midterm two from the spring 2019 iteration of Data 100. One thing to note is that this was the first semester in which the course had two midterms as opposed to one. Okay, let's get into it. So in the first problem, feature engineering, we're given four feature vectors. Okay, and we're told up here that for each of them, yi is equal to the dot product of our feature vector f of xi and beta, where beta is some column vector. Okay, so before we get any further into the question, what does this really mean? So for example, um, option A is that f of x is um, the vector 1 and x. Okay, so let's come over here and write that. 1 and x, and we're told that beta is some column vector, okay? And by that, we mean some column vector of scalars, so real numbers. So for example, let me just say beta is the scalars a and b. So what I get when I multiply the transpose of f of x with beta is just this function of x, a plus bx, okay? And so I can do this for all four of our options. And so what this really means is that we're given four generalized functions and four plots. And we want to see which of these scatter plots, or yeah, plots of, yeah, scatter plots, can be described by each of these different functions. Okay? So before we look at each plot, let's try and figure out what function each of these four options represent. Okay? So looking at the first option, we've already identified that it's a function of the form a plus bx which is just your standard line, y is equal to mx plus b. So let's write that over here. This is y is a plus bx. We can do the same thing for the second option. So we can go over here and say yi is x 2x, that vector dot product with our beta again, which is a vector of scalars, which gives us a times x plus b times 2x. And we notice, we, like, you know, by collecting like terms, this is really just equal to a plus 2b times x. But remember, a and b are just some real number scalars, and so a plus 2b is also just some arbitrary scalar. So this is really just a function of the form y is equal to c times x. And really there should be little i's here, but that's okay. This is really just a function of the form y is equal to cx which is a line that passes through the origin. Okay, it's y is equal to mx, a slope with, without the intercept. Okay, so this is really a function of the form y is equal to c times x. Okay, we can do the same thing for the third one. We get y is a plus bx plus cx squared, so a parabola. Um, but one thing to note is that our constant c over here could be set equal to zero. Okay, any of a, b, or c could be equal to zero. And so anything that um, we can re represent with option a, a plus bx, could also be represented by option c, because we could just set the constant c equal to zero. And the last one is y is equal to a plus b times the absolute value of x. And so for this one, um, I want to take a look at what it really looks like. Okay, just as a reminder, the absolute value curve, y is equal to the absolute value of x, looks something like that, but it should be centered on the line x is equal to zero. And the function we have here, a plus b times the absolute value of x, remember adding a to a function just shifts it up or down, a or negative a units. And multiplying it by b stretches it vertically by a factor of b. But nowhere here, are we moving our curve horizontally? Okay, and what I mean by that is that this has to be centered at x is equal to zero. Okay, and that's important because this will come up in one of our option choices. Okay, this is an absolute value curve that's um, centered on the line x is equal to zero. So it's centered on the y-axis. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. Now let's go through each of the plots. 
So the first one, we have something that quite clearly looks like a line. It seems like the um, change in y is constant between each of the points. And so we can definitely represent this with option A. Okay, because we could pretty easily figure out what the A and B are in A plus BX. And if we can represent it with option A, as I mentioned earlier, that means we can also represent it with option C, because we could just set the constant C equal to zero. So now our question is, can we represent this with option B? And the answer to that is no. Because as I mentioned, option B has to pass through the origin. Otherwise, it's just some line that passes through the origin. And now the question is, does um, the plot, the, the first plot, pass through the origin? And the answer is no. Because the y value when x is 0 is equal to 4. Which means it doesn't pass through the origin because it passes through 0, 4. So that means option B doesn't hold here. Similarly, option D also doesn't hold because this isn't quite an absolute value curve. For, for example, um, and the, what I mean by that is the reason we can for sure rule this out as being an absolute value curve, like how do we know that um, the, the V of our absolute value isn't over here and our curve looks something like this? Or similarly, how do we know that the, the, you know, the corner of our absolute value isn't over here? It's because our absolute value has to be centered at x is equal to 0. And at x is equal to 0, it doesn't appear to be the case that we have some sort of v, either opening upwards or downwards. So we know for certain that this, is, this can't be represented by a plus b times the absolute value of x. So that means d is also not an option. Since we have more than one correct option, e is also not an option. So here the correct answers were a and c. Now moving on to option number two. Quite clearly, this looks like a parabola. Okay, and so this one isn't really a trick question. If you really wanted to prove rigorously that this is a parabola, you can find the first differences and then the second differences and show that the second differences are constant. Uh, but you can take my word for it here. This is something that can be represented by y is a plus bx plus cx squared. Okay, but we need that plus cx squared term, which tells us this really can't be represented by any other option. So it can't be option, oops, can't be option A, can't be option B, can't be option D, and so it's option C, which means it also can't be E because E is none of the above. Okay? Now the third and fourth ones are a little more tricky. So the third one, I'll tell you right off the bat, is E. And the reason is because this is not a function at all. Remember, for a function of the form y is equal to f of x, which is really what we have here, just with some slightly different notation, you pass in our input x, and you get exactly one y out. Right? You may remember in some earlier courses that for some set of points to be a function, it has to pass what is called the vertical line test, right? You should be able to put a ruler on whatever your screen, the page, and move it across, and your ruler shouldn't intersect your curve at multiple points at any point. But here you can see when our input is x is equal to 1, oops, our output could be y is 1 or y is 5. Okay, when our input is x is equal to 3, our output could be y is 2 or y is 4. So this one's not a function at all, and our four options here are all functions. So none of our options can really depict the scatter plot that we have in option 3. So the, op the answer is E. Okay, in option 4, we're given something that kind of looks like an absolute value, right? The corner is somewhere down here. It's at x is equal to 4. And so we know that it already looks something like an absolute value, so it can't really be represented by A, B, or C. Because A is just a general line, B is a line that passes through the origin, and C is something that's a parabola, and this is none of those things. But remember, we said that um, for option D, this will only fit an absolute value curve that is centered on the line X is equal to zero. Here, the center, the vertex, is not at x is equal to 0, it's at x is equal to 4. 
that's where the corner of this absolute value is. Okay, and our function y is equal to a plus b times the absolute value of x only fits absolute values that are centered at x is equal to zero. This is not centered at x is equal to zero, so option D also cannot describe this. So the correct one here is option E. So that wraps up number one. Great, so now let's move on to number two, estimation. So we're told that we have a learning set or training set x1, y1, all the way through x10, y10. That's sampled from some population where x and y are both binary variables. So they're both equal to zero or one. And our learning set data is summarized by this table of row counts. So we're told for each possible combination of x value and y value, how many times that appeared in our learning set. And we decide to fit a constant model probability y is one given x is zero is equal to the probability that y is one given x is zero is equal to alpha using the cross entropy loss and no regularization. What's the formula for the empirical risk on this learning set for this model and loss function? And we also need to find the alpha that minimizes empirical risk. Okay, that's a lot to take in, but for this, it's really a problem in understanding the definitions. So firstly, we're told that we're using the constant um, model alpha. So there's no logistic regression involved, even though we are going to use the cross entropy loss function. Okay. And conveniently on the front page of the exam, we're given the cross entropy loss function right here. Okay. Which I've also written over here on the right for our convenience. Okay. So you didn't need to memorize that coming in. So just to remember the empirical risk, is the average loss over our entire training set or learning set. So here, the cross entropy loss, this expression over here, is just for a single point. We need to average that over the 10 points in our learning set to come up with the empirical risk. So our empirical risk is something like one over 10, since we have 10 points, times the sum of this loss function over each of our yi's. So first, there's two things to note. One, the cross entropy loss function over here doesn't involve any of the x's. It's only in terms of the y's. So that'll actually make our calculations much simpler. Another thing to note is that here, at least in the spring 2019 semester, data represented our prediction, as I wrote over here. Um, in previous semesters, Data represented the model, like what beta was used for in spring 2019. Um, by the model, I mean the model parameters, so the weights. But in spring 2019, theta was the entire estimate itself. And here, alpha is the entire estimate. So we can really replace all of these thetas with alphas. Okay, so over here, I can write the risk of alpha is one-tenth of this sum. Okay, so now what I need to do is figure out what the cross entropy loss is for each of these 10 points. As I mentioned earlier, it only depends on the y's. So really I can write an even more summarized table of y values and the number of times they appeared. Okay, there's only two possible values of y, zero or one. Y was zero in these two cases, which happened three times total, right? Two plus one. And then y was one in the other two cases, right here and here, which happened three plus four or seven times. Okay, so what that means is three of the 10 terms in our sum will correspond to when y is zero, and the other seven terms in our sum will correspond to when y is one. Okay, so one thing to notice in this expression over here, if y is equal to one, the second term drops out because one minus y is then zero and that entire second thing is equal to zero. Similarly, if y is equal to zero, this first term drops out, okay? Because if y is zero, we're multiplying by zero, that first term doesn't um, factor in. So that means each of the terms in our sum will either be something times log theta 
or something times log of one minus theta or alpha, I mean. It won't be both of them. Okay, and what I mean by that is for the points where y is equal to zero, the loss of zero and alpha is equal to negative zero log alpha minus one minus zero log one minus alpha. The first term goes away and here we're left with negative log one minus alpha. Similarly, the loss of one with alpha is negative one log alpha minus one minus zero log one minus alpha, which gives us negative log alpha. This first loss um, form, I guess, appears three times, and the second one appears seven times. So that means over here, I can say my empirical risk is one over 10 times three times negative log of one minus alpha, because there are three points that fit that pattern where y was zero, plus seven times negative log of alpha. Okay, now I can factor out the minus sign out front, so I can have minus one over 10 in the front, and then I have three times log of one minus alpha, plus seven times log of alpha. And that is the empirical risk um, in terms of alpha. Okay, the solutions just distributed the negative one over 10, so the solutions wrote it like negative seven over 10 log alpha minus three over 10 log one minus alpha, just in case you're referencing that, but they're really the same thing. Great, so now, the second part, what we want to do is estimate alpha hat. So we want to find the alpha that minimizes the empirical risk. And so how do we minimize a function? We take the derivative or the gradient, set it equal to zero and solve. So let's take the derivative of this risk with respect to alpha. Remember over here, the derivative of log of x with respect to x is one over x. I believe we're told that we can assume that we're using the natural log. Maybe that was a clarification, but um, let's just assume that we can use, that we're using the natural log. And so we're left with negative one over 10. And now we have three times one over one minus alpha times the derivative of one minus alpha, which is negative one, plus seven times one over alpha. And the derivative of alpha is just one, so we don't need to multiply anything there. And we set that equal to zero. Okay, now it's just up to us to solve for alpha. We can multiply both sides by negative 10, so we can essentially ignore the negative 1 tenth out front. And so simplifying this, we get seven over alpha, so this over here, minus three over one minus alpha is equal to zero. Great, I can just add three over one minus alpha to both sides, which essentially just moves the equal sign over here. Now I can multiply both sides by one minus alpha and then alpha, which gives me seven times one minus alpha is equal to three alpha. Then I can say seven minus seven alpha is three alpha, giving me seven is 10 alpha yielding alpha is 7 tenths. And since it's an estimate, like the estimate that minimizes um, our risk, we say it's alpha hat. So the value of alpha hat here is 7 tenths. So just to recap, in the first part, we found an expression for the empirical risk by averaging our cross entropy loss over all 10 of our points. And in the second part, we went ahead and took the derivative of it with respect to alpha, the derivative of it with respect to alpha, set it equal to zero and solved for alpha. In part B, we're told that the true population probability that y is zero, given that x zero is a third. And we wanna, what we wanna do is find the bias of the estimator of the probability that y is zero, given x is zero. 
um, for the constant model in part A. Okay, so to do this, first let's recap the definition of bias, which is also given to you on the front page of the exam. So uh, don't worry if you don't remember it. So the bias of an estimator theta hat, so remember theta hat is a random variable, with respect to the true parameter theta is the expectation of the estimator minus the true population parameter. Okay, so theta hat is a random variable. And why is it random? Well, because it depends on our learning set. Okay, and this bias is over all possible learning sets. Okay, this estimate of theta hat is an average, or the, sorry, this expectation of theta hat is an average over all possible training or learning sets. Okay, and so what we wanna do is find the bias of the probability that y is zero given x is zero. So one thing to note was that the model in the first part, the probability um, that y is one given x is zero, that was alpha. Okay, the estimator for the probability that y was one given x is zero is alpha. That means the estimator for the probability that y is zero given x is zero is just one minus alpha. Okay, because given the fact that x is zero, y is either one or zero. If it's one with probability alpha, it's zero with probability one minus alpha. Okay, and these should be hats because these are our estimators. Okay, with that hat on top means it's an estimator, okay? And so what we want is the bias of the probability that y is zero given x is zero. Well, that's just the expectation of the probability that y is zero given x is zero, the estimator of that, minus the true value. We're given in the problem that the true value is a third. And the estimator for the probability that y is zero given x is zero is one minus alpha hat. So this just reduces to the expectation of one minus alpha hat minus a third. And so the reason we can't plug in alpha hat is seven tenths here, and this came up a lot in regrades, was because this um, estimate of alpha seven tenths was only to this specific learning set in part A. Whereas bias, the expectation is over all learning sets. Okay, it's more of an abstract concept, but this expectation is over all learning sets. Okay, so we can't just plug in the value from part A. This alpha hat and the alpha hat up here are slightly different things. Okay, and so this really is just the final answer. You could also, by linearity of expectation, rewrite this as two thirds minus the expectation of alpha hat. But it's important to note that the alpha hat in this problem is not the same as the alpha hat in the previous problem. And once again, the reason for that is because the alpha hat in the previous problem um, was just the optimal alpha that minimized this specific um, training sets, um, empirical risk, whereas the alpha hat when we're dealing with bias is over all learning sets. Okay, and of course we don't have access to all learning sets, so we kind of just have to leave it as an expectation. Okay, it's more of an abstract idea, but nevertheless, this is what the definition of bias is, and here we sort of just applied that. So that's problem two. This is completely aside from the video, but you might notice that you know the background is different now, um, and it's because I actually recorded the solution for question one, two, and five in August of 2019, uh, but I never got around to finishing questions three and four until now, which is November 2019. So I actually fil filmed um, the first and last part of these, this video um, three months ago when I was back home in Canada, um, but now we're finally finishing it up. So that's why you know the background and stuff is different. And that's also why um, the audio might sound slightly different um, for some of these questions, but not that that really changes anything. In question three, we're told that we have a learning set, also known as a training set, of size four, um, which we've sampled from a population where X and Y are both quantitative. So we essentially just have our training set here. We fit a linear regression model um, 
beta naught plus x times beta one, where beta naught and beta one are scalar parameters by using ridge regression, minimizing this objective function, okay, which we are given here. And we're told that we want to figure out um, what exactly goes in, oops, what exactly goes in this x matrix, in this y matrix, um, well, y vector, I should say, and whatever goes there, okay? And so for this, I think it's important to draw a parallel between, maybe I'll do this over here, draw a parallel between the objective function we're given and ridge regression, okay? And what I mean by ridge regression is um, the objective function for ridge regression phrase in terms of vectors, okay? We know that the risk, maybe make this a little thinner, the risk for um, ridge regression is typically framed as the L2 norm of Y minus X beta squared plus lambda times the L2 norm of beta squared, where here beta is some vector. So you can see roughly that the second term in both of these correspond to one another with lambda being equal to a third, right? Um, what I'm highlighting, this L2, oops, that's not a highlighter, uh, L2 norm squared of beta is precisely just beta naught squared plus beta one squared, because in for our purposes, um, beta, this vector, is just made up of beta naught and beta one. And this first term corresponds, right? So the L2 norm, I did it again, this L2 norm of y minus x beta quantity squared is just this sum of um, y actual minus y predicted squared for all of our observations. The only difference is that we have this factor of 1 over n, in this case 1 over 4, out front um, in the objective function that we were given. And we'll address that in just a second, but for now let's just pretend that this 1 over 4 isn't there, okay? And let's just pretend that the um, matrix vector formulation of the ridge regression um, objective function and the one that we were given are exactly the same. And we have lambda being equal to a third. Okay, so what we wanna do is fill in all the blanks to compute these matrices. So this first one we were looking at X transpose. And we know that X is our data matrix where the first column of X corresponds to our first feature and the second column of X corresponds to our second feature. Here, we see that we really only have one uh, quantitative feature, which is our scalar of x's, okay? And you can see that, that feature is given by 2.5, 2, 1, and 3. And we see that those appear in the second row of x transpose, which means uh, those would have been in the second column of x, right? Because the rows of x transpose are the columns of x. So now our question is, what would have been in the first column of x. Well, it's whatever I multiply beta naught by in my expression um, for calculating my model. And we see that beta naught corresponds to the intercept term. And in order to have an intercept term, we need to have a column of all ones in our data matrix. So that means this first row of x transpose, which again, which would have been the first column of x, is a column of all ones, right? Because this is what we need for our intercept term beta naught, right? This is what gets multiplied by beta naught. This is what gets multiplied by beta one. Y transpose then um, is just our vector of our actual observations, okay? And so that is over here, three, five, three, and five. Cool. Um, so X, is our data matrix here we've written as X transpose just to save space. Y is our vector of observations. Lastly, all we need to fill in is um, what goes in this square matrix down here in our solution for the optimal value of beta, beta hat. And so recall the solution for ridge regression, oops, let's not show that yet, that's a spoiler. The solution for ridge regression, beta ridge, is given by X transpose X, plus lambda i inverse x transpose y. So here we have x transpose x already done, and we also have x transpose y done. So these terms have already been taken care of, which means that this box down here just needs to be lambda times i, i.e. 
the identity matrix, which is the matrix of just all ones in the diagonal, scaled by um, lambda, which we identified to be a third over here. So I can put one third on the diagonal and zero everywhere else. And this answer, the way I've written it, we gave as um, we gave full credit because this was actually the answer we intended. But it's not actually the correct answer for the objective function that was given in the problem. And so now, to show you why, let's remove, or like, let's pretend like this 1 over 4 actually was there. Okay? We, for now, ignored the factor of 1 over 4, but this actually changes our answer. And so for that, I want to scroll up here. There are two variants of the ridge regression objective function that exist. Okay, and the difference is whether or not there's a factor of 1 over n out front. Okay, so you can see the one in red does not have a 1 over n in front of y minus x beta's L2 norm squared, but the one in blue does have a 1 over n. And it turns out that their solutions are very similar, almost exactly the same, but the solution when you have a factor of 1 over n out front actually has plus n times lambda i as opposed to to just having lambda i, okay? The reason this, is, this was unintended was because we almost never look at the solution for ridge regression being the second thing, right? The one with n lambda i. This first one is almost you know, universally known as being the solution for ridge regression, which is why we accepted one third on the diagonals as an answer. But if we wanted to be true to the objective function that we provided in the question, these actually would have been, oops, these actually would have been four-thirds. And so that's why if you look at the solutions for this exam, it, say, it says four-thirds on the diagonal because that's what's correct with the objective function that was provided since there was a one over four out front. But the answer we um, intended and the answer um, that we gave full credit for in addition to four-thirds was one-third. Okay, this is just one thing to keep in mind. Um, the objective function for ridge regression sometimes has this 1 over n out front. Oops, sometimes has this 1 over n, sometimes does not. And the, uh, whether or not you have that 1 over n leads to a slightly different solution where your identity matrix is just scaled by another factor of n. So instead of lambda, it's n lambda. Um, that really, like, you know, thinking about these two different forms of ridge regression, uh, objective function, was really not the point of this question, um, but the reason I elaborated that here was just for know, your own understanding. In part B, we're told without computing values for beta naught hat and beta one hat, um, write an expression for the squared error loss for the learning set observation x4 comma y4 in terms of beta naught hat one, or sorry, beta naught hat and beta one hat and any relevant numbers. My solution should not contain y4 hat, x4, or y4, but instead just numbers, beta naught hat, and beta 1 hat. Okay, we're told that we want to compute the squared error loss for just this observation. So really what I want to compute is y4 minus y hat 4 squared. Okay, and this is the L2 loss for a single point. Remember, empirical risk is the average of our L2 loss over all of our points. But just for a single point, this is the squared loss or L2 loss. In our case, y hat is just beta naught plus beta 1 x. And in our case specifically, this is x4. These should be hats on these betas because we're assuming that we found the optimal values and we're given beta naught hat and beta 1 hat. Now all I need to do, and I forgot the squared over here. Now all I need to do is substitute in values for x4 and y4. And to do that, I can just scroll up over here. Oops, sort of all over the place with notability today. I'm told that x4 is equal to 3 and y4 is equal to 5. So I can plug those values in. 5 minus beta naught hat plus um, beta 1 hat times 3. And that is precisely the squared error loss for um, prediction x4 comma y4. And there's really no other way we can simplify this because we don't know what beta naught hat and beta one hat are. So I'll write that again here just for the sake of clarity. 
But that is the squared error loss for the prediction that we are told to compute it for. And that wraps up question three. Great. Now in question four, we have a couple of multiple choice questions dealing with feature engineering and model selection. In part A, we're told that we have some quantitative outcome Y and two quantitative covariates X1 and X2. Covariates is just another term uh, for features, right? And what we want to do is fit a uh, linear regression model for the conditional expected value expectation of Y given X of our outcome given the covariates, including an intercept. Okay, one thing I'll note is that if you're watching this in fall 2019, we didn't really use this notation of expectation of Y given X, but that really means just the same thing as Y hat. Okay, what's our predicted value of Y given some input X? And uh, you know, these two things are defined the same regardless of which semester you took this course in. You just take your vector X and find the dot product of it with um, our optimal parameter vector beta. So there should be a hat on this beta, right? Where X is a vector corresponding to all of the features for a single observation, and beta is this parameter vector that we find by minimizing some empirical risk. And that's how you, um, you know, compute Y hat for a single prediction. What we want to do in part A is figure out the minimum dimension of the parameter vector beta needed to express this linear regression model. Well, so here, we're told that we have two features, x1 and x2, and we also have an intercept term. So this one's not really a trick question. The answer is three, right, because we have one um, beta value corresponding to our intercept, one corresponding to x1, and another corresponding to x2. So in this case, our model might look like, uh, let's just clean things up a little here. Our model might look something like beta naught plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 where everything here is a scalar, okay? We need three values of beta because you have two features plus an intercept. In B, we're told that we again have a quantitative outcome Y, so some real number, but we instead have two qualitative covariates, X1 and X2. So now instead of X1 and X2 being numbers on their own, they're both categorical labels, okay? And we're told that X1 takes on values A, B, C, and D, and X2 takes on values E, F, and G, and that, uh, they are nominal, essentially. Um, there's no ordering to these values, okay? And what we want to do is fit a linear regression model, again, um, using an intercept term, and we want to figure out the minimum dimension of our parameter vector. Okay, so this one is not as straightforward as part A, um, so let's jump over here and quickly review the idea of one-hot encoding. Right, let's, for instance, let me just uh, rewrite some of the pertinent for information. X1 takes on values A, B, C, and D. X2 takes on values E, F, and G. Okay, let's suppose we wanted to one-hot encode just X2. And let's suppose we also want to have an intercept uh, column. Okay, so by default, we can start off by having four columns, one for E, one for F, one for G, and one for our intercept. We know our intercept column will be full of all ones. And by one-hot encoding, we know that for each row, exactly one of these three columns will be equal to one, and the other two columns will be equal to zero. Right? For each row, we have a one in the E column if you know the first if, if that observation um, for X2, this is, was equal to E. We'll have a one in the F column if that observation's X2 is equal to F, and so on and so forth. So what this matrix might look like is something like you know, one, zero, 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 one, zero. 100 zero, zero, dot 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 zero, zero, 001. Of these three columns, exactly one of the values will be zero for each row. Sorry, one of the values will be one for each row, and the other two values will be equal to zero. This matrix is not full rank, and here's the reason why. If I add up my column E, my column F, and my column G, since exactly two of those values is equal to zero and one of them is equal to one, the sum of those three columns will be equal to one for every single row I have. And technically, these should all be vectors, okay? Right, regardless of the row, if I add up the values in the E, F, and G column, the result will be one. And so it turns out my intercept column can be written as a linear combination of some of my other columns, okay? 
And if, you know, one of my columns can be written as a linear combination of other of my columns, well, that tells me that, um, you know, the, the vectors that make up the columns in my uh, matrix are not linearly independent. And since my columns are not linearly independent, an equivalent condition is that my matrix is not full rank. Okay, so this matrix, as I've written it, is not full rank. Okay, and so in order to sort of retain all of this information, but have my design matrix or my data matrix be um, full rank, what I need to do is drop one of these three columns. I need to drop E, F, or G. Okay, and so let's say we drop the G column. Okay, and so now instead, we just have three columns, an E, an F, and my intercept column. My matrix is now full rank because I can't write um, any of these columns as a linear combination of the others. But an important thing to uh, note is that I still have all of the information that I had before. Okay, the reason for that is because my G column, I can like compute those values by just taking my intercept column and subtracting away my E and F columns. Okay, because um, again, the sum of E, F, and G is one. So all of the information that my G column conveyed is still implicitly here. So by dropping that column, I'm not losing any information. It's just that by dropping it, my matrix is now for rank. Okay, so that explains why we need to drop any columns in the first place. So now we have a one-hot encoding of just X2. Now let's try and factor in X1 and really matrix sign should start here because those things are not part of uh, the design matrix. Okay, so now what we want to do is incorporate A, B, C, and D. For a similar reason, we're going to have to drop one of A, B, C, or D, right? Because just as with E, F, and G, it's true that A plus B plus C plus D is equal to the intercept column, right? Because that, that's a separate one hot encoding. So I can arbitrarily choose one of these to drop. And so let's just say we drop the D column. And now, uh, to, in order to one hot encode X1, I have three columns, A, B, and C. In order to one hot encode X2, I have two columns, E and F. And then I have my intercept column, which in addition to making my model more flexible because you know it gives us an intercept term, it allows me to um, implicitly compute all of the information that I dropped, right? It lets me compute the D column because I could do one minus A minus B minus C. It lets me compute the G column, right? One minus E minus F. And so having that intercept column makes things a little more flexible, right? And so in order to one hot encode each of these features, we had to subtract one from the number of possible labels that they, they could take on, okay? So I had four possible labels that X1 could take on. So I subtracted one of those. I dropped the D column here. But again, we really could have dropped any of them. Then in order to one hot encode X2, I dropped one of E, F, and G. So that's three minus one. Plus I have my intercept column. So four minus one plus three minus one plus one. That gives me six, which is the correct answer. Oops. Which is the correct answer for part B. Great. In part C, we're asked to bubble all true statements. In ridge regression, when the assumptions of our linear model are satisfied, the larger the shrinkage slash penalty parameter, what happens? Okay, and so one thing to note is that the shrinkage slash penalty parameter is just lambda, which is, uh, and lambda, as we know, is the penalty on the norm of beta, right? Um, and we're sort of asked to figure out as lambda increases, which of these things happen. Okay. And so remember, as lambda increases, we're penalizing larger values of beta more and more. And so as lambda increases, the norm of beta decreases. Okay. And just as a refresher down here, we can write the um, empirical risk for um, ridge regression looks something like y minus x beta the L2 norm of that squared plus lambda times the L2 norm squared of beta, right? So as lambda increases, the L2 norm of beta decreases. So what does that actually mean? Well, as lambda increases, our model becomes more and more general, okay? So larger values of beta, and by that I mean um, larger entries in our beta vector are penalized, right? And remember, just to make it crystal clear, beta is a vector here. 
Um, and so our model becomes more and more general and less and less, less and less complex. Okay. And this is, you know, a fact that we've studied over and over in lecture, but as Lambda increases, bias increases, uh, but model variance decreases. Okay. So our, the bias of our predictions will go up, uh, but our, the amount by which our model varies decreases because it's more general and it's overfitting less to our training data. Uh, we hope that by making our model more general, it'll fit better to um, unseen data that comes from a similar distribution as our training data. Okay. And so really what we need to do here is pick the options that match that intuition. So we see that options one and two are complements of one another. Okay. Only, it only really makes sense for one of those to be correct. Same thing holds for options three and four. Only one of those could be correct. Okay. And so the first option or the first two are asking us to choose, does the bias increase or decrease? I just said that the bias increases. And again, this is a well-studied fact from lecture. The third and fourth are asking us to pick, does the variance of our model increase or decrease as Lambda increases? Well, the variance of our model decreases, right? Because again, our model is becoming more general, less overfit to our training. The fifth option was sort of just thrown in there uh, as a trick almost, okay? It's, a, it's asking us whether or not the true mean squared error of our um, estimator of our model decreases as lambda increases. And it turns out that we, we don't know because the true mean squared error would require us to know what the actual model generating our data is. And it would require us to know exactly um, like the probability distribution from which um, our data is drawn from, like the data generating process. But that's not something we will ever actually know. And so it's impossible to answer this question. Okay, really the bulk of this question was in options one to four. Five is just sort of thrown in there as something that you might pick. But the correct options here are one and four. Part D is a very interesting question. We're asked to bubble all true statements, a good approach for selecting the shrinkage slash penalty parameter in lasso is two. And so again, lambda is the shrinkage slash penalty parameter. And you know, as we've seen in lecture, whenever we want to pick a value of a hyperparameter, and remember lambda is a hyperparameter, what we want to do is perform cross-validation. Okay, and we won't talk too much about exactly what cross-validation is, but essentially it's the way that we pick values of our hyperparameters so that they don't overfit to the training data or testing data that we're given. Okay, and so we know that, you know, we're choosing a value of lambda, we're going to have, you know, a bunch of different candidate values, and we will want to perform cross validation. So that means options one and two and five don't hold because those options have nothing to do with cross validation. And we've you know, looked at time and time again, Picking a value of a hyperparameter, we want to use cross validation. And so now the question is is the answer three or four? Do we want to minimize the cross validated regularized risk for the squared error loss function, or do we want to just minimize the cross validated non regularized risk for the squared error loss function? Okay, and so it turns out that the answer is number four, and here's why. So when we're trying to find our value of beta, we use the regularized um, version of our loss function. And so specifically for lasso, our loss function looks something like, you know, y minus x beta, the L2 norm of that squared, plus lambda times the L1 norm of beta, okay? We provide some value of lambda and, you know, using gradient descent or whatever, we will be output back some optimal value of beta. So we use this to find the optimal value of beta for that choice of lambda, okay? But now that we have this optimal value of beta, beta hat, in order to see how well it performs, the loss we will use is just L2 loss, okay? It's not regularized loss, okay? And so, um, you know, given beta, however we find it, the loss we will actually care about is y minus y hat, the L2 norm of that squared, right? And remember, as I mentioned earlier, y hat is just x um, 
times beta hat, and you know this is in the interpretation where y is a vector of a bunch of observations as opposed to a single output. I can rewrite this as y minus x beta hat, right? This is the loss I care about, given my value of beta, right? The whole point of using regularized least squares is to come up with a more general, um, less overfit value of beta. But the model that we're using, right, the output of y for a single prediction being x transpose beta, right, and this is for a single uh, scalar output y, this is for a matrix, uh, matrix of x that is, our model is not changing, right? And so it doesn't make sense to evaluate our model, that is for a given choice of beta, on a regularized uh, loss function. We use the regularized function to come up with beta, but once we have it, we just use squared error um, or L2 loss as we have done here. Okay, so it's a very nuanced question, uh, but I think that it tests a deep understanding of what's really going on here. And the main thing you want to get out of this is that using the regularized um, empirical risk is what we do to choose beta. Once we've chosen beta, our model is still just X transpose. Okay, and that's number four. Okay, and now on to the last problem, number five, which deals with logistic regression. So the first two are multiple choice. Okay, and we'll kind of do them together at the same time. So in part A, we want to bubble the expression that describes the odd ratio of a logistic regression model. Okay, and the second option, we want to bubble the expression that describes the probability that y is zero given x for a logistic regression model. So for logistic regression, the main thing to remember is that the probability that y is one given that x is some value is the sigmoid of x transpose beta. That's the definition of our logistic regression model. Okay? And since given one particular x value, y is either 1 or 0, the probability that y is 0 given x, as we're sort of given in the uh, hint, is just 1 minus the sigmoid of x transpose beta. Okay? Great. And so let's start simplifying the probability that y is zero given x. Remember, the sigmoid function, I guess I can just write this over here, the sigmoid of x is one over one plus e to the negative x. Okay, so that means the sigmoid of x transpose beta is one over one plus, oops, one over one plus e to the minus x transpose beta. And so now we want to bring this one out front in, uh, in a common denominator. So we can put it 1 plus e to the minus x transpose beta on the denominator and numerator. And then minus 1 over 1 plus e to the minus x transpose beta. Great. And now we're left with e to the minus x transpose beta over 1 plus e to the minus x transpose beta. Okay. We're almost at the answer for option B, but this form, the way it's written right now, is how we will simplify question A. But let's finish um, working on question B and then we'll get back to question A. This doesn't quite look like any of the options in part B just yet, but notice what happens when I multiply both the numerator and denominator by E to the X transpose beta, which we can do because we're essentially just multiplying by one, Right, and so now, now on the numerator, I have e to the negative box times e to the box. That just multiplies to be one, right? Just by exponent rules, e to the minus x times e to the x. You add the exponents, minus x plus x is just zero. So e to the zero is just one. Now on the denominator, I have e to the x transpose beta plus one again. Now this looks awfully similar to the sigmoid of x transpose beta, just we're missing a minus sign down here. There's no minus sign. So this is actually the same thing we would get if we plugged in negative x transpose beta into our sigmoid. Okay, because then the 
double negatives would cancel out, and that's why we don't have a minus sign down here. So it's actually the case that option B, or question B, the correct option is the first one. The probability that Y is zero given X is the sigmoid of negative X transpose beta. And we just worked out the arithmetic for that. But now let's go back to part A. We want to bubble the expression that describes the odds ratio. Okay, and for that, we'll want to use this form over here. Okay, and so what I just wrote in the box, or what I just boxed, is the probability that Y is zero given X. So let's go down here. We want the ratio of the probability that Y is one given X over the probability that Y is zero given X. The probability that Y is one given X is, this, is the standard sigmoid expression that we've seen. And the probability that Y is zero given X is what I have up in the box. And notice now the denominators of both of these fractions, right? I have one fraction divided by another fraction are the same. So I can actually cancel these out. And if you don't believe me, we can go over here and say A over B divided by C over B. How you simplify these is you take the first one multiplied by the reciprocal of the second, and you see that these two cancel out and we're left with just A over C. And so now over here, if the denominators cancel out, we're left with one over e to the minus x transpose beta. But e to the minus x transpose beta just means um, the reciprocal of e to the x transpose beta. So now this is the double reciprocal of e to the x transpose beta. And so the two reciprocals cancel out. And so we're left with just e to the x transpose beta which is the third option. Oops, right there. Okay, so to recap, in part, we kind of did it in the opposite order. We did part B first, then part A. In part B, we found a simplified expression for the probability that Y was zero given X. And in part A, we use an intermediate step of that simplified expression in order to help us determine the odds ratio of a logistic regression model. The probability that Y is one given X over the probability that y is zero given x. Great, now let's move on to part C. We wanna bubble all of the following which are typical effects of adding an L1 regularization penalty to our loss function when fitting a logistic regression model with parameter vector beta. Okay, so remember what L, what a L1 regularization penalty looks like is we take our standard empirical risk and we add lambda, so some constant, times the L1 norm of our beta vector. Okay, and one thing to remember about L1 regularization, or when we're talking about least squares lasso uh, regularization or lasso regression, is that it encourages sparsity. Okay, so in general, the point of regularization is to make our models less complex, and we do that by uh, decreasing the sizes of the elements in our beta vector. But L1, or lasso in particular, what it does is it encourages sparsity, which means it sets many of the elements in our beta vector equal to zero. Okay, so if, you can, if you're thinking about this in terms of the linear regression and feature engineering context, setting a feature's weight equal to zero is essentially ignoring that column, so it's kind of doing feature selection for you. Okay, but that's not really what this problem is asking. That's an aside. And so what we need to remember for L1 regularization, in general, it makes the elements in beta smaller, but it also um, sets specific elements equal to zero. Okay, so now between the first two options, the magnitudes of the elements of the estimator of beta are increased or decreased. Here, what we were really going for was decreased. Okay, but um, the way the question is worded, it's not entirely clear what decrease means. What L1 regularization does is it decreases the magnitude of beta, but individual elements, we don't know what will happen. In general, they will probably become smaller, but it's possible that some of the elements in our beta vector, right? And remember, beta just is a vector of scalars. It's possible that some of these beta i's stay the same or get bigger. 
We know in general the norm of beta will decrease, but some of these elements may stay the same or get bigger. So it's not necessarily clear that um, the second one is true. And so on the midterm, we gave points to both the first and second option. But what we were really getting at was the second option, that in general, the size of beta decreases. This is just a little nuance that kind of complicates the question. Option three, all elements of the estimator of beta are non-negative. That's not necessarily really true. There's no restriction on the sign of the elements in our beta vector. They can be positive or negative. That doesn't really change anything. Of course, any norm of a vector is non-negative, but that's not really what this is asking. Option four, some of the elements of the beta vector are zero. Yes, that's true. And that's what I was mentioning earlier about um, L1 regularization encouraging sparsity. Okay, so the correct options here were two and four. D, what would be the primary disadvantage of a regularization term of the form, the sum of our beta vector entries cubed, rather than the more typical ridge penalty, the sum of our beta um, vector elements squared for logistic regression. So here we're comparing the sum of beta j cubed versus beta j squared. And so the main downside to cubing them is that if a number is negative, its cube will also be negative. Whereas no matter what our number is, if you square it, it will be zero or greater. And so the downside here is that in order to minimize the sum of cubes, you just make every number as negative as possible. Okay, so if you're, we're talking in the logistic regression context, where we would typically use something like gradient descent, on each successive iteration, it will just set the elements in our beta vector to be more and more negative. Okay, so the elements in our beta vector will all approach negative infinity because there's no one global minimum for the sum of these cubes, okay? Because you can just keep making them more and more negative. Okay, and you can really see this by plotting x cubed, which looks something like this, right? Versus x squared, which is something like that. Right? x squared has a global minimum, x cubed does not. Okay, so this will just make the elements in our beta vector more and more negative. So there's not one global solution that it can approach. Okay, so no unique solution. Great. Lastly, part E for logistic regression model, probability that Y is one given X is the sigmoid of negative two minus three X, where X is a scalar random variable. What values of X would give the probability that Y is zero given X is greater than or equal to three quarters? Okay. Here, this is essentially working out algebra, okay? So we want the values of x such that the probability that y is zero, given x is equal to little x, is greater than or equal to three quarters. Well, we know that the probability that y is one given x is this sigmoid quantity. So the probability that y is zero given x is one minus that, okay? So what we're really looking for is to solve for x in this expression over here this inequality, rather. Okay, we need to solve for x here. And so first, I can um, add the sigmoid quantity to both sides and then subtract 3 quarters. So I get 1 quarter is greater than or equal to the sigmoid of minus 2 minus 3x. Then I can expand out the definition of the sigmoid. I have 1 quarter is greater than or equal to 1 over 1 plus e to the, now remember, we take the negative of whatever um, the argument of our function is, right? Because the sigmoid over here, sigmoid of x is 1 over 1 plus e to the minus x. So minus of negative 2 minus 3x is just 2 plus 3x. Okay, we have the double negative there again. Now I can multiply both sides by both denominators. So I have something like, Oops, 1 plus e to the 2 plus 3x is greater than or equal to 4. Then I have e to the 2 plus 3x is greater than or equal to 3. Now I can take the log of both sides. So I have the log 
of this quantity on the left is greater than or equal to the log of three. And now remember, the log of e to the anything is just that thing, okay, by the log rules. So now we have two plus three x is greater than or equal to log three. And now I can just rearrange for x, okay? So I have three x is greater than or equal to log three minus two. So x is greater than or equal to log of three minus two divided by three. So any value of x that's greater than this, greater than or equal to this, will satisfy the inequality that we're given in the problem. Okay, x is greater than or equal to the log of three minus two divided by three. And how we got there was just by using the definition of our logistic regression model, right, which we wrote up here, and by working out the algebra. Okay, so I think that wraps up problem five, which means we're done walking through the midterm. Good luck studying and feel free to post on Piazza or send me an email if you have any questions with anything we talked about.